focus on what matters. Welcome to our Bridging the Gaps in Health Access virtual event. I'm Margaret Talib, the Managing Editor for Politics at Axios. I'm coming to you today from Lewis, Delaware. And thanks to Genentech for making this conversation possible on what's next for ensuring access to quality healthcare. I'd like to welcome our audiences today on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, LinkedIn, and of course on Axios.com. And you can join the conversation today on Twitter with at Axios and hashtag Axios events. Now, over the next 30 minutes, I'll be joined by my colleague, Marisa Fernandez, and we're going to be talking about what healthcare leaders are doing to fix the problems that the COVID-19 pandemic has exposed, like expanding access to care for minority and rural populations and making the kind of innovations that are needed to strengthen delivery systems for all of these services. Our first guest is the representative for California's 36th Congressional District and chairman of the Congressional Hispanic Caucus, Representative Raul Ruiz, joining us from Palm Desert, California. Hi, Congressman. Hi, it's good to be here. Well, it's great to have you with us. Um, let's start with your story. You were born in Mexico, raised in the Coachella Valley in California. Your parents were farm workers, and then you went to Harvard. You became an ER doctor, and for almost the last decade, a member of Congress. But in the last year, you've had a really unique vantage point because during the pandemic, when you're not on the Hill, you have literally been vaccinating your own constituents, putting needles in their arms. And many of these are farm workers or from underserved communities. Um, I'm curious, do you have an approximate count? Do you know about how many vaccinations you have done personally? Uh, I, I believe I've done over 100 uh, vaccinations at about over four, five different vaccination clinics that I helped get started and uh, helped organize through my office in a collaborative called the Equity Collaborative in the Coachella Valley. Uh, it has been an incredible experience. I'm an emergency medicine physician with training in, in humanitarian disaster aid and public health crises through the Harvard School of Public Health. And so, uh, in addition to that, my parents were farm workers, and I grew up in a farm worker trailer park for the first few years of my life as a toddler uh, here in my own district. So being able to go into the community that was hardest hit in the pandemic and, and really apply the life-saving vaccines to the members of the community who are at highest risk of getting infected and being hospitalized and dying from the uh, coronavirus was was like a dream come true because as a kid growing up in in in, uh, in the fields I used to dream about being a doctor and coming home and serving people and uh, and just the relief in in the parents faces uh, and and the, the faces of the people that I vaccinated they 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 would say they waited uh, forever to get the vaccine we were taking it to them which was different a different approach and they were saying now I can go to work now I can start working again I can I can start earning an income and, and help and support my family and so it really it really made a big difference what were the biggest obstacles uh, to their not getting the vaccine to begin with? Did, how much of it had to do with like vac vaccine hesitancy uh, or versus not knowing where to go versus knowing exactly where to go, but literally not having the time or like the flexibility? It's not like um, a lot of your constituents probably don't have like um, a lunch hour or access to a car or something. What, were, what did you find ended up being most consistently the obstacles to getting the shot? Well, I can tell you by far, it's not vaccine hesitancy. Uh, it is a lack of resources and know-how and, and being able to overcome the barriers that already exist in an underserved community with a lack of physicians, a lack of doctors, a lack of, a lack of uh, uh, resources, uh, clinics, uh, a lack of health education, also in a language that they would understand, a lack of transportation. And so... That's why it was so pivotal when the Biden administration created the retail, federal retail pharmacy uh, partnership program and directly giving the uh, vaccines to the FQHCs that exist in the communities. And then 
with community organizations to take the vaccines into the community, uh, that was the game changer in all of this. And now we have some of our farm worker communities that have 70 to 80 percent vaccination rates because no you overcome the, those barriers if you partner with local communities and take the vaccines to the people, just like we did taking the tests to the people. You take the vaccines to the people in a community grassroots uh, organizing way and you get incredible results. I think people trust their doctors more than they trust their congressmen most of the time. Maybe that's not fair. I think that's probably fair, though. Um, what did you feel like you learned from your, your patients or your constituents um, that you didn't know before in the process of vaccinating them and talking with them about the virus? One is even in farm worker uh, communities, the influence of social media and misinformation. Um, now, the few that do have vaccine hesitancy uh, follow the misinformation that they're receiving in social media and the clips. And so being able to go into the fields where I would literally get in back of a, of a truck and host vaccine and COVID information educational sessions uh, during their lunch breaks uh, was was very helpful because I was able to to put to rest some of these myths of of infertility of chip tracking devices and other nonsensical uh, uh, reasons why people were very hesitant to get the vaccines. But let me reiterate the importance of having clarity in this community, whether they're farm workers or Hispanic underserved communities, that, that the number one reason is the lack of concerted uh, strategic, effective outreach and resources going into the community uh, for them to get vaccinated. And that's important because one uh, would give a way out for policymakers who do not want to spend the resources and take that extra effort in addressing equity in our communities by saying, well, they just simply don't want it. It's not our responsibility. It's their responsibility who chooses not to get it. The other approach is to say, if you take the vaccines, they will they will get vaccinated. And in my experience so far, based on the literature, uh, the Kaiser Foundation did a study that showed that Hispanics were twice as likely, more more likely wanting to get the vaccine than uh, than their white counterparts. So this is very important to understand because that puts the onus on policymakers and public health experts to strategically find the solutions to uh, to do the projects necessary to better outreach and take the vaccines and healthcare into the community where it's needed the most. I was going to ask you that. Do you feel like there's applications beyond the COVID vaccine yes, uh, from yes, this idea of much. going into the, tell me about that. Like what other are Margaret, you thinking like? That's the key. You're absolutely right. We've learned a lot through this pandemic. One of the things we've known all along is that healthcare disparities exist. For those of us who have been working in the field, uh, doing not only uh, uh, public health uh, projects, vaccination projects during previous pandemics, but also health education in, in the field, uh, we knew that we have health disparities and there's a crisis in health disparities. There's no wonder why the Hispanic population, including poor farm workers, uh, got infected twice as much, got hospitalized three times as much as other counterparts, why they were dying in an alarming rate. Uh, we know the living conditions of overcrowdedness, not having enough space to quarantine, not having enough access to the resources to get tested or the time or the transportation to go get tested or get the vaccine, et cetera. All those combined with the lack of clinics and uh, and in their communities uh, was a brewing ground for death in and high mortality during this pandemic. So what do we learn? We learned that digital home based community based care uh, with a a a partnership with community members that will take resources into the community and connect the the patient to the physician via any digital platform or telemedicine what i call tech medicine using their platform is going to be the wave of the future so we know through for example studies that if you provide a more direct 
care and counseling uh, into the patient's home, into their community, they're less likely to get sick, they're more likely to be satisfied, and lower you would lower the costs uh, because they're not going to the emergency department or being hospitalized. The other thing that we need to take away from this is that our healthcare workforce is quite fragile. Uh, we saw a lot of the front lines break, not just in terms of the lack of of personnel that was available for the enormous amount of uh, hours that were required to take care of the really sick patients, but also the fatigue and the anxiety and the stress and those that got sick and were quarantined or died uh, really made a, a negative difference uh, during this pandemic. So we have to beef up our uh, medical, nursing, uh, uh, respiratory technician, our public health workforce, so that we're not so vulnerable for another uh, major disaster or a public health crisis, uh, and we can really hold the line. Uh, already Tutor. about a third of our workforce is in retirement age, and, uh, and, and so I'm very concerned that you see a large retirement uh, from them. I know there's two other areas you've been really interested in. I hope you'll come back and talk about both of these with us. Uh, one is exactly getting this provider shortage, whether it's physicians or nurses or others in healthcare, into rural communities, communities need. The other is the diversification of clinical trials and making sure that those are uh, uh, better rounded. I guess as you leave us, can you give us a sense of whether uh, either of these is poised to pass in this session of Congress or whether this is going to uh, be issues to tackle into and after the midterms? Look, we, we, we need to tackle them. Uh, if we want to address equity, if we want to make sure that we understand the pandemic uh, in its entirety, especially in communities that disproportionately have been, uh, have been devastated uh, from this pandemic, both medically uh, and economically, but also disproportionately lacking in the treatment and the vaccination, then we have to study those reasons. And we have to study those treatments and vaccinations and ensure that we have all populations, large populations represented in those trials. Diversity and Trials Act will help in, uh, motivate and empower institutions to recruit more minority populations, women and other uh, uh, under understudied groups uh, in order to ensure that when we do have a treatment or medication that they also work for those individuals. Uh, and so that's gonna be very key. I'm very hopeful that we will have expansion of the teaching health centers uh, bill uh, and my GME uh, flex, uh, cap flex bill that would allow institutions that serve in underserved areas to uh, the flexibility to expand their programs and training grounds because we need more doctors and we need to, to really uh, ensure that our studies are, and populations that are being studied are reflective of the populations in our country. And so I'm, I'm really working to try to put those in the Build Back Better Act, but of course, all of that will be subject to the Bird Rule and, uh, and the Parliamentarian, um, but we'll continue to advocate for those uh, this Congress. So yet, uh, yet one more uh, reason why the final outcome of the infrastructure and reconciliation talks could be truly impactful. Well, uh, Congressman Ruiz, I really wanna thank you for joining Axios today for this conversation. Thank you. It's a pleasure anytime. And next, we have a view from the top with my colleague, Vice President of Communications at Axios, Yolanda Brignani. Thanks, Margaret. And now joining us from Philadelphia, we have Fritz Bittenbender, the Senior Vice President of Access and External Affairs at Genentech. Hi, Fritz. Hi, hey, Yolanda. How are you doing today? Good, how are you? I'm so excited about this conversation. So am I. It's a th thank, you for, uh, thank you for having me and I look forward to it. Absolutely. So let's dive in. Can you awesome. share a bit about Genentech, um, your company's mission, and what your current priorities are as it relates to public policy? Absolutely. So, Yolanda, for those who don't know, Genentech was actually the first biotech company. Um, we founded the biotech industry about 45 years ago. Um, and since then, we've grown to one of the largest biopharmaceutical companies in the entire world. Um, we're owned by Roche Pharmaceuticals now, a global pharmaceutical company. Um, but Roche has really given us um, the ability to 
you know, continue that innovation and science-focused mission um, that we had since the inception of the industry. And, you know, this year, as an example, we're going to invest about $13 billion in research. That's the largest um, investment in research of any healthcare company in the world. Um, and that research is focused across a broad range of areas, including oncology, um, neuroscience, uh, orphan and rare diseases, and with increased focus, um, particularly in the last five years on Alzheimer's um, as well. Um, so we're focusing on really hard to treat um, areas where there's a high unmet medical need. And as a science company, we're focused on the most, most difficult scientific uh, problems to solve for our patients. Um, from a policy priority perspective, of course, we're all watching what's happening in Washington and the debate right now around you know, drug pricing. And, and we have a goal really um, out of that conversation to be a partner with policy leaders to lower at patient out-of-pocket costs, lower costs for government, but do it in a way that uses market forces um, and continues to allow us to make that significant investment in innovation. Um, beyond that, we're also really focused in health equity, which is certainly a topic of our conversation today, and where we think the future of medicine is going to go, which is in, in personalized health care and that intersection of, of therapeutics, diagnostics, and big data um, to drive personalized medicine over the next decade. And I know you talked a little bit about research and development, and we know that it's critical to invest in that and to ensure that everyone has access to the medicines that they need. What needs to happen in order to ensure con continued innovation and equitable access to healthcare for everyone? Yeah, I think that's a great question. I mean, one of the things that we've seen coming out of the pandemic is there's a bright spotlight that's been shown on the fact that we don't really have equitable access to healthcare across America. I um, mean, real early in the pandemic, um, we had a partnership with IBM Watson. We were looking at data um, from around the country and, and patient outcomes, um, the medicine they received, the outcome they had in different healthcare settings. And we found real early on some, some dramatic disparity in the treatment, particularly in rural and underserved communities in America in COVID. And I think it just shined a light on the fact that um, we have a significant problem in health equity um, in the United States in our healthcare system. So one of our major policy goals is, is trying to change that. Um, you know, we went early on in the last administration to the Surgeon General and others to show them this data to try and figure out how we could focus um, the COVID effort more in underserved uh, communities that were seeing disparate care in COVID and having negative outcomes for patients because of that. And you know, one of the things that we did is, is really focus some of our research efforts, both in the diagnostic space, um, as well as in the therapeutic space um, in those underserved communities. And we continue to focus there, um, both in terms of clinical trials and trying to diversify our clinical trial base to have more access, particularly Black and Latinx populations in our trials, but also on the healthcare policy side, you know, ensuring that any policy that the state or local governments or federal governments are enacting are thinking about health equity um, with, with a significant policy lens when, when they're talking about changes to our healthcare system. And you alluded to this a little bit in your previous um, answer, but as COVID-19 pandemic has reinforced, there's so many roadblocks to clinical trial participation, particularly among patients of color. Um, yep. What can industry, government, and the public, what can we all do to really remove this? Because that really is kind of the key to moving forward in so many ways. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think there are probably, for me, and in, in, our, in our policy thought leadership, there are four critical areas for this. There's, there's first of all, access to healthcare and access to, um, you know, to innovative medicines and products and tests, um, access to, you know, best healthcare systems that patients can get. Um, there's affordability. You know, we still have to make healthcare affordable for everyone in this country, and that's, you know, that's a critical step. Um, there's knowledge, you know, patients and their physicians have to have knowledge about the most innovative and cutting edge treatments if they're going to be able, you know, uh, to, to prescribe them for patients and if patients are going to be able to get them at, at their pharmacy. And finally, there's a hesitancy issue, particularly in certain rural and underserved communities about, you know, trust in the healthcare system and in their physicians and even in, in innovative medicines. And if we're going to attack um, equitable health care in this country, we have to attack all four of those things. You know, we have to ensure that every patient has access to the most innovative medicines. We have to ensure they have access that's affordable to them. You know, we have to make sure that 
Um, we're doing diverse clinical trials all around the country, not just elite trial sites, so that patients and physicians get access to trials and trial medicines broadly across the United States. And then finally, I think we have to work with communities and other thought leaders and policymakers to address some of the hesitancy question. And, you know, that's real. There, there's history behind that in terms of, you know, how clinical trials were conducted, you know, a long time ago and the impact on certain communities. And, you know, we have to really address the hesitancy issue along with all those others if we're going to be successful. And I know we've talked about a lot today, but like looking to the future, what do you believe are the greatest opportunities and challenges for the industry? I think we face the greatest opportunity right now and some of the policy challenges that are being discussed in Washington. You know, there, there's a path forward where we can actually come together and, and, and lower patient out-of-pocket costs and lower costs for government, but do it in a way that preserves innovation. You know, some of the policy you know, uh, options they're talking about don't do that. They're destructive for the industry and they will fundamentally affect patient access and our ability to invest in medicines moving forward. So short term is the policy challenges. Long term, it's how do we leverage the incredible amount of innovation that's happening right now and things like personalized health care and, and delivering medicine differently through telemedicine. And, um, you know, basically using these as, as opportunities to drive better healthcare delivery and personal outcomes for patients um, through innovation. And in doing so, we're actually going to dramatically lower healthcare costs in America. Um, so, you know, I think we need to keep that long-term focus on innovation and we need to get over some of the short-term policy hurdles and fights and, and, you know, finger pointing about what's wrong in the system. And we need to focus on the patient, patient access and then ensuring we can fund and continue innovation because in the end of the day, that's, that's going to solve a lot of the healthcare problems that we have in the U.S. right now. I want to thank you so much, Fritz, for this fascinating conversation. It's been great. I want to also thank Genentech for sponsoring this event. Thank you a lot, Yolanda. And thank you to Axios for you know, having this critical conversation on health equity. It's so important for our future. So thank you. And now I want to turn it over to my colleague, Marissa Fernandez. Thanks, Yolanda. I'm Marisa Fernandez, and I'm a healthcare reporter at Axios. Our final guest is the president and CEO of the Biotechnology Innovation Organization, Dr. Michelle McMurray Keith, joining us from Washington, D.C. Hi, Michelle. Hello, it's a pleasure to join you. So, the pandemic has exposed the lack of healthcare access in a variety of ways. What's being done to address this in the biomedical innovation space? So many things, and we only have a few minutes, so I will have to dive right on in. You know, I think the most important thing to, um, to state is that all of the companies are really dedicated to making sure they're not just working incredibly hard to find vaccines and cures, but that they are working just as hard to make sure that those, those products reach every patient who needs them. You know, we are not out of this pandemic until everyone around the globe is safe from COVID. And so we have a lot of work to go before we sleep. So let me start on um, just the COVID access front. So across the US, um, our organization and many of our companies were very, very busy fighting for um, free access to COVID vaccines, COVID diagnostics, COVID therapeutics. This was work that we were tackling in the Congress and had quite a bit of success around. And you've seen that at play across the US. But at the same time, we have to keep our eye on the global needs as well. And so our companies have entered into over 300 manufacturing partnerships around the globe to try to make sure that um, COVID vaccines reach every corner of the globe. And at the same time, they've spoken out and we've spoken out against um, overstepping with the Defense Production Act. It, it sounded like such a, a wonderful invocation at the beginning of the year when the Biden administration said, yes, we're going to put the Defense Production Act in place to make sure we speed up the production of vaccines. But what actually happened is it stopped COVID vaccines at our borders and made it more difficult for our companies to export doses and it made supply chains difficult to fill around the globe because it also applied to the some 200 ingredients and, and materials that go into producing an mRNA vaccine, for example. 
So those sorts of uh, well-meaning but ill, <laughs> ill impacting um, initiatives have really slowed our global progress. But the good news is that we are now taking off and we predict that we'll have more than 12 billion doses of COVID vaccines available to the globe before the end of the year. So the pandemic in, in COVID vaccines, as you mentioned, have put the clinical trial process in the public limelight. So as we know, clinical trial samples have a history of not being as diverse and reflective of a population. Is there a way that we can harness all this public attention in bettering these trials? Yes, we can not miss this window of public attention on clinical trials. Um, to make it clear that our trials have to be more diverse. Our clinical trials have to be representative of the people they serve. You know, the, the dirty little secret, um, I'm a former FDA regulator, Food and Drug Administration regulator, and the dirty little secret in FDA is that double-blind placebo-controlled trials, which are the gold standard of how we conduct clinical trials today, are actually rarely predictive of exactly what you see when you use that medical product, that drug, that vaccine, that medical device out in the real world. And so we should be doing everything we can, one, to make sure we're capturing real world evidence, which is by definition more representative and more diverse, but at the same time that we are diversifying um, clinical trials that are really targeted and fit for use. So both of these ends of these equations are critically important, not just for representative sake, not just so everyone can have confidence in the medical products that they receive, but also so we can really have an eye to meeting all of the needs and treating all the symptoms of disadvantaged communities and communities of color. It's critically important and, and we cannot wait to help make that happen. Okay, I wanna shift over to drug development. Um, what are the biggest challenges when we're talking about equitable access in that space? Mm. There are many challenges. Um, we've, we've seen over the decades um, that we have not been as inclusive as we've needed to be in the biomedical research field um, and the people who are conducting research and also in the people who are part of the research process, as we mentioned, through clinical trials, um, but also with the physicians who are caring for patients at, at the end of the day and deciding which products to use. We need diversification of that entire pipeline and at Bio, we've started our bioequality agenda really to fight for just that. So that's critically important. But we also have to be on guard um, against policies that could actually worsen disparities. You know, this month, Congress has been debating um, drug pricing legislation, and it's really price control legislation that would make it very, very difficult for our companies to gain the private sector investment from investors that are really needed to tackle tough diseases. There will always be investment for drugs like Viagra, but what we really need to do is make sure we continue to have a healthy ecosystem so we can get more and more diseases like sickle cell, um, like type two diabetes, the research attention that they need and deserve. Okay, thank you. And what do these ideas look like on an individual community level? How do we incorporate trust even if there is better access? Well, trust is very slow to build and easy to lose. And so it's really, really important that we are having frank conversations with community leaders. We've been brokering these kinds of conversations throughout the last 18 months you know, putting our COVID vaccine and therapeutic manufacturers in close contact with black churches, for example, and community leaders. That's all very important, but this can't just stop at the end of COVID and which we all hope is coming sooner rather than later. This has to be an ongoing process of dialogue so that com communities are participating in shaping and designing clinical trials. They're saying what's needed for them to feel like they're health needs are being met, and they have an avenue and a voice and are standing up uh, to be incorporated in biomedical research. We spend so much time in our country debating access to healthcare, which is critically important. Of course, that's table stakes, we must have it. But 
if you look at what's available to physicians today, there are not a lot of clinical options for diseases that are ravaging minority communities like type two diabetes, like heart disease, like stroke. And so the true answers for disadvantaged communities are still on the research shelf. They're still coming down the R&D pipeline. And we need to make sure that we don't shut off that pipeline before it can really help these greater communities at large. Okay, thank you. And when we're looking at these greater communities at large, what should we be looking for? Should we be reaching out for our leaders? Like how can people get involved if they Mm -hmm. themselves want to learn more about clinical trials or just figure out like what's best for them in terms of individual access? Right. So most people are familiar with clinicaltrials.gov, which is the the National Institutes of Health website that has all clinical trials in process, but it's it's difficult to navigate for practitioners and um, difficult to navigate for anyone, I guess is the easy way to put it. Uh, We are working with our member companies right now to build a patient portal to help patients really explore much more easily and facilely what clinical trials might be available to them. Patients should also be talking about clinical trials when they're having conversations with their clinicians um, and making sure that they're encouraging their clinicians to get involved in clinical research. It's so important and often those who are on the front lines of public health don't wanna take a moment away from delivering care and you understand that that, um, drive, but at the same time, we need them to be a part of the biomedical enterprise as well. So that's really important. Um, And then they can always come to bio. Um, dot org and read Good Day Bio. We talk about the blow by blow of what's happening with clinical trials and how they're evolving each and every day. So stay informed, um, stay connected with your clinician, and remember to always seek a clinical trial if the option is is available. I want to thank Dr. McMurray Heath for joining Axios. Thanks so much. It was a pleasure. Thank you all for joining this afternoon for another virtual conversation that has made everyone smarter, faster. Thank you to our sponsor, Genentech, for making this event possible. For more information or to sign up for our Axios Vitals or Axios Sneak Peek newsletters, visit axios.com slash newsletters or on the Axios app. Thank you all for joining, and we'll see you on axios.com.